If you struggle with low motivation, having no drive, or an addiction to modern day pleasures, I promise you after watching this video, you will understand how to take control of your dopaminergic system and actually rewire your brain. As always, my name is Max, I'm a medical doctor and endurance athlete trying to bring you the best possible information regarding both your health and physical performance. Now, let's get into one of my favorite topics, dopamine. Okay, so let's talk about dopamine. So as you can see, this was me a couple of years ago. I was addicted to fast food, social media, and other types of modern day pleasures. And I went from that to being actually highly motivated, having a very high drive, and having absolutely no addictions. And yes, this is me swimming in ice water. Trust me, you need a lot of motivation to swim in ice water. And so in reality, this video is actually for the past version of myself. These are all the things that I wish I knew back then in order for me to faster overcome my low motivational state and my addiction to modern day pleasures. Okay, so let's talk about dopamine. Dopamine is a molecule. It is both a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. Before diving into the neuroscience of dopamine, I want to give you a couple of real world examples that will help you understand what dopamine is and how it relates to your reward circuit. So the first example is dopamine and its relationship to motivation. They actually did this experiment already on rats, but for today's purposes, I will just use an imaginary human being. So here's the situation. We have a person, he's sitting in front of a table with some healthy foods. And just one meter away is a table with a nice burger. I think we all enjoy burgers, so this is something that is much more pleasurable. And so dopamine is not actually responsible for feeling pleasure, because if our person that doesn't have any dopamine would eat all this food, it would still evoke some pleasure. But what he wouldn't do is he wouldn't get up, exert effort in order to get the burger. So if a person has normal levels of dopamine, he will stand up, walk, even if it's a very short distance, but it still requires effort, he will want to exert that effort in order for him to get the reward, which in this case is the burger. So dopamine is not responsible for feeling pleasure because once again, the person that has depleted dopamine will still enjoy eating food, but he will not get up, walk one meter for the burger. But another thing that I want you to understand is how dopamine is related and correlated with a reward system. I will give you another real life example. And by the way, this has already been replicated in very big companies. Let's say you have two people doing the same job. Employee number one gets paid $50,000 per year. He doesn't really have any bonuses and he doesn't really have a great working environment. This person will still produce some amount of dopamine during his work because, well, he doesn't get nothing. He gets $50,000 a year, but his dopamine levels will not be extremely high. He will do the work. He will do good work, but it's not going to be anything great. And he will not feel a particularly high sense of reward. However, if you were to take that same employee, but now pay him $200,000 a year and maybe offer bonuses on top of that and a great work environment because that person has a much greater sense of reward. His dopamine levels are going to be through the roof. He will be much more motivated to produce a much higher quality and level of work because he has the incentive. He has a much higher reward and the higher the reward, the bigger his motivation and dopamine is going to be responsible for that. And by the way, there are actual companies that have implemented this method in order for them to grow. And so we know that this actually works in the real world. So if there are any business people watching, you might want to think about that. So now after seeing some real world examples, let's talk about the neuroscience of dopamine. And of course, we're going to start with the functions of dopamine. Now, as you can see, this is a view of a human brain. And what you can see here is there are four distinct pathways. So you have the mesocortical pathway, you have the mesolimbic pathway, tubular infundibular and nigrostriatal pathways. But we need to focus on two pathways, the mesocortical and the mesolimbic. Why? Because dopamine is responsible for motivation, memory and learning, cognition. And the pathway that is responsible for all these things is the mesocortical pathway. So dopamine gets produced right here. This is your midbrain. This is where the word meso comes from because it's the mesencephalon, which refers to your midbrain, right? And your cortex is going to be primarily your frontal cortex. So the mesocortical pathway, it's a connection between your midbrain where dopamine is produced, and then it gets sent to your frontal lobes. And by the way, remember your frontal lobes are responsible for your higher order thinking. So whenever you want to exert some sort of effort, especially when we talk about discipline, or you have some goal in mind, 
you think with your frontal lobe. The frontal lobe will be responsible for that reasoning and goal setting. And so the second pathway is your mesolimbic system. And this is very fascinating because once again, meso just refers to the midbrain, but your limbic system, in particular, your nucleus accumbens is part of regulating emotions. So the next time you have a very bad emotional state, you are stressed or you're panicked, you most likely will increase the amount of dopaminergic inducing activities that you already do. So as you can see, there is a connection between your dopamine system, your limbic system that is responsible for your emotional state, and then your frontal cortex, which is responsible for higher reasoning. All these things are interconnected. And this is very important when talking about addiction, because there is higher reasoning. There are destructive things that you do that you know are bad for you, that you will still do because there is a connection between your frontal cortex and your midbrain. And the question is, which circuit is stronger? So as you can see in your brain, everything is connected. And by the way, dopamine is not only essential for motivation and reward, but also for voluntary movement. This is thanks to your nigrostriatal pathway. This is very crucial to understand because these connections between your frontal lobes, between your midbrain and between your limbic system are going to be very important when we now are going to talk about your baseline of dopamine. So every single person has a baseline level of dopamine. We don't know the exact amount of dopamine that is at normal levels, but we do know that there is some sort of normal activity. And so if we have a person that is addicted or unmotivated, instead of his baseline dopamine being here, it's going to be here. It's going to be much, much lower. So a person that is either unmotivated or addicted will have a lower baseline of dopamine. And this we can actually see during a functional MRI scan. If we have a healthy brain, we would see your basal ganglia light up red. Red would mean that there is high dopaminergic activity. But if we have an addicted brain, we look at someone who uses hard drugs, we will see that these areas will remain main green. Green would be indicating that there is no dopaminergic activity. So even though we don't know how much dopamine you need, we do know that there is a certain baseline and that that baseline can be very low in addicts. Okay, so now you know that there is a baseline level of dopamine that you require to live a healthy and motivated life. We talked about the functions. Let's talk about one of the most important balances when it comes to your dopaminergic system. It is the balance between pleasure and pain. Now, to be honest, this balance I find absolutely fascinating because it explains so much when it comes to human behavior and addiction. Now, a rule that you always want to follow in your life, there needs to be an equal amount of pain and an equal amount of pleasure. And so because of that, we can actually split the dopamine into good dopamine and bad dopamine. Now, please note that when I say good dopamine and bad dopamine, I divided this specifically not based on the dopamine molecule because dopamine is just a molecule. It's not going to change. However, the activities that you do can be either good, you know, something like an ice bath or bad, something like drug use. Now, we already know that we have a baseline of dopamine. And whenever we engage in certain activities, we can see an increase in that baseline. And so we have a few examples of the good activities that produce dopamine. You know, chocolate will increase your dopamine levels by 1.5 times, exercise will increase them two times, and then an ice bath can have a 2.5 increase in your base baseline level of dopamine. And so some bad activities that can increase dopamine are, for example, smoking. This can increase your dopamine levels two times. Cocaine, which can increase your dopamine two and a half times. And then methamphetamine, which can increase your dopamine 10 times from baseline. And so another reason why I distinguish good activities from bad activities, because the response of dopamine is completely different. Let's take an ice bath. Whenever you engage an activity that first requires you to experience some sort of pain, so we start with a painful stimulus, by the end of the activity, you will see an increase in dopamine levels and then a sustain in high dopamine levels a few hours after that activity, and then your dopamine levels will return to baseline. So this picture is very important to understand because as you can see, the spike in dopamine that you get is only after you finish that activity. And then we have a sustained increase in dopamine after the end of the activity. So the pain pleasure balance remains the same because you had a painful stimulus, you managed to overcome it, and then your brain rewards you with a lot of dopamine. And then you return to baseline values. As you can see, there is no crash of dopamine here. This happens, you know, when you take an ice bath or when you exercise. And the reason why I included chocolate in the good dopamine is because if you do not have an addiction and you have enough painful stimuli in your life, so you engage in enough strenuous or difficult activities. If you eat a piece of chocolate, I will argue that you're not going to see a dip in dopamine because the pain pleasure balance remains the same. However, the same thing cannot be said for either an addicted person 
or for substances that do not involve some type of pain to overcome. And so if we take smoking for an example, whenever you smoke a cigarette, there is no painful stimulus that you need to overcome. You will immediately get a peak, a spike in dopamine. However, because there was no amount of effort needed to smoke, you not only get a spike in dopamine, but then you also get a crash in dopamine. Your dopamine levels drop below baseline. However, after that, they will return to baseline. However, if you engage in activities that only induce pleasure and there is no amount of effort involved, what will happen is that with repeated use, for example, let's take smoking, with repeated use of cigarettes, not only will your dopamine peaks get smaller and smaller, so you will not experience that much pleasure, the dip in dopamine will increase and you will not be able to return to baseline values. So your baseline values of dopamine will drop. And this is where we develop a dopamine deficit. Now, let me explain why if you only engage in pleasurable activities, your baseline level of dopamine will drop. Because as we can see, your brain is composed of neurons and neurons need to communicate with one another. And they do that with the help of synapses. A synapse is a connection between two neurons. And the way nerves communicate with each other is they package neurotransmitters, in this case, dopamine in specific vesicles, and then they release them into the, this is called the synaptic cleft. And then the dopamine molecules freely float around and they bind to the receptor and then stimulate this nerve. By the way, dopaminergic neurons are excitatory, not inhibitory, for example, like serotonergic neurons. And so in a healthy person, you have a huge amount of dopamine receptors and a huge amount of dopamine available. However, what happens when you over excite a neuron? So if there is a lot of stimulation to the neuron, it will say, okay, this is too much. Enough with that. I need to downregulate my receptors. And downregulation is a real term in pharmacology. It simply means that there will be fewer receptors available for dopamine uptake. And not only that, but your dopamine that is packaged in these vesicles will be much less. So there's much less dopamine produced and the uptake of dopamine by the help of the receptors are also going to be diminished. And this is exactly what happens to the neurons in the brain of any person that is addicted to any substance and essentially exposed to too much dopamine. However, now, because we understand this, let's move to a different topic. And I am talking about anticipations and craving, because if you're able to understand this, you will have a complete picture of what dopamine dopamine does in your brain and you will understand how rewards are able to contribute to your specific addiction. So I mentioned that the mesolimbic pathway is responsible for your reward circuit. This is very important to understand. Let me give you an example with someone who has a addiction to sugar. So he will have an emotional trigger. And once he experiences this feeling of craving, his body will release a certain amount of dopamine. It's going to be a small amount, but this is necessary for him to be motivated to go get that sugary snack. And so two things can happen. The first thing is he can actually go get that sugary snack and eat it, in which case there will be a much bigger release of dopamine and this would be the reward. So he would have a craving and then he would have a reward. And this can be very dangerous because your brain loves rewards. This is how people get addicted in the first place. You will have a huge release of dopamine and your brain will say, okay, so I have an emotional trigger and then I have a certain response and I get a reward because I feel good. Let's repeat this behavior again and again. This is how you can get addicted to sugar. However, if you get a craving for sugar and you decide to abstain from that sugary snack, you will experience a crash. You will experience a decrease in normal levels of dopamine. And so let me explain the anticipation and reward pathway. The reason why the reward pathway is very dangerous because it is reinforcing. If you have a craving for sugar and then you actually end up eating that sugary snack, increasing your dopamine, your body will not just give you a reward, your body will reinforce that behavior. This is why dopamine plays a key role in addiction. And the second thing I want you to understand is that if you decide to experience a crash in dopamine, there are two things that can happen, a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is that if you experience a crash in dopamine, this can lead you to work much harder to try and increase your dopamine levels. This is evidenced by social media. If you scroll on Instagram and you see posts that are boring, you had an expectation going on Instagram that you will see fun and exciting posts. And then when nothing comes, then there are posts that you do not like, you will experience a decrease in dopamine because there is no reward. What will end up happening is you will scroll further and further until you reach 
the post that you wanted to see. And then you will have a big spike in dopamine. And that will once again be a reinforcing behavior. By the way, if you want to talk to me about that, I provide one on one consultations regarding both your health and physical performance. If you're interested, you can click the link in my bio and I will see you there. Now back to dopamine. As I said, option number one, when you experience a dopamine crash is that you are going to work even harder to have that peak in dopamine. However, the way you overcome addiction is by resisting the urge. So you will have a craving for sugar and you will resist it. This is why, you know, abstinence is one of the treatment for addiction, because with time, the crashes of dopamine that you experience based on your emotional trigger will become less and less evident. The same goes for your emotional trigger in the first place. Your craving for sugars will actually reduce with time when the brain doesn't get its reward. This is why it's called the reward pathway. If you're able to resist that craving for sugar and you don't give your brain that reward, there is no point for your brain to keep giving you those emotional triggers because it knows there is no dopamine that is coming. That is the basic principle in how you overcome addiction. And so this was the video about dopamine. However, I will do two more videos on dopamine. The next one is going to be specifically focused on dopamine and addiction, where I will go through a full process on how to actually overcome your addiction and how the limbic system and your frontal cortex are related with dopamine and how you can influence every single system for you to actually overcome that addiction. Because even though abstain is a foundational principle in treating any addiction, there are a lot of processes specifically involving your frontal lobe and your limbic system that have to be mastered before even coming to the point of abstinence. And then the third video is going to be about dopamine and its relationship to high performance. So if you want to know how to get motivated to go ice swimming or do very difficult things, I will have also a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that. Now, I hope you liked my video and if so, I will see you in the next one.